Earlier this week, the Ethiopian military withdrew its forces from Mahale, the capital of the war-torn Tigray region, after the government declared a ceasefire. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed denied reports his military was defeated by Tigrayan forces and offered another reason for the retreat. When we entered Macau seven or eight months ago, it was because it was the center of gravity for the conflict. It was center of a government, a center for known and unknown resources. But by the time we exit, there's nothing special about it. The Ethiopian prime minister is a Nobel Peace Prize winner. He's come under fire for his response to the conflict that erupted in November when the Ethiopian government launched an offensive against Tigray separatists. Since then, thousands have been killed. Over a million civilians have been displaced. Some 350,000 people are now on the brink of famine. Abiy has denied there's hunger in Tigray, but the United Nations says it's the worst malnutrition crisis in a decade and it's projected to get worse without urgent aid and unhindered access to those in need. The UN's says multiple parties in the conflict may be guilty of violating international law, possibly amounting to war crimes and crimes against humanity, including indiscriminate killings and sexual violence, using rape as a weapon of war. Meanwhile, results are expected soon from last week's parliamentary and regional elections that will determine whether Abiy Ahmed will remain in power. For more, we're joined by two guests. And Addis Ababa Stanley Chitekwe is with us, the chief of nutrition at UNICEF Ethiopia. In Washington, D.C., we're joined by Alamayo Fento Wildemariam constitutional law scholar, political theorist and conflict analyst, previously served as a national peace advisor to the Ministry of Federal Affairs, currently lectures at Mahala University's School of Law. Uh, he's also political commentator for Ethiopia Insight. And uh, we're going to turn to you first, Alamayo Fento, Wildemariam. Thanks so much for joining us. Can you talk about the significance of this ceasefire, why it happened, and um, all this in the context of the elections and and the famine that uh, could engulf uh, this area of Tigray. Uh, thank you, Amy, for having me. Uh, I think uh, one thing that we need to be very clear about the unilateral truce is that there isn't such a thing as unilateral truce, especially in the in this context uh, in which uh, the, the prime minister declared unilateral ceasefire. He was defeated in the past two weeks. Um, massive counteroffensive was happening, uh, uh, was mounted against the Ethiopian National Defense Forces by the Tigray Defense Forces. Uh, they were able to rout several divisions of the MDF. Uh, so it's after this defeats that uh, the, the federal government uh, said it has called for a unilateral truce. So as to its significance, the significance uh, is also something that the international community, as well as the people of Tigray, need to be vigilant about. Uh, because uh, even if what the, I mean, if the truce was honest, the Ethiopian government we would also tell its allies, the Eritrean forces and the Amhara regional forces, to withdraw from territories, to grant territories that they have occupied since the start of the war in uh, November, uh, on November 4, uh, 2020. So this is, this is going to be a very uh, a prelude to the ultimate sh showdown between Amhara and uh, Tigrayan forces on those western and uh, southern territories of Tigray. And that would be a very destructive. And Alma, you anticipated this conflict as early as 2018. Can you explain uh, why you thought this uh, uh, violence would, would break out? And also, if you could give some context as to the origins uh, of this war, uh, the historical origins of it? So Ethiopia has been tittering on the brink of civil war for quite some time since the coming to power of the new prime minister in April 2018. Uh, the prime minister uh, had this extraordinary talent for trickery and fraud. So one of the very first things he did in the very first uh, few months uh, after coming to power, was 
uh, in uh, 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 contravention of the Constitution to give the marching order to the National Defense Forces to intervene in the Somali region of Ethiopia to remove its leader. So now that it has come a full circle, it started out in Somalia, in the Somali region of Ethiopia, by removing the leader. I mean, uh, the the regional leaders might be responsible for some heinous human rights violations, but the constitutional procedure for armed intervention in the internal affair of a region, uh, a region which is a member of the Federation, has not been followed. So uh, what he did also was he played the same, he, he played the same uh, political uh, theatrics, legal and political theatrics, uh, uh, they put on a show of constitutional interpretation, uh, which uh, prohibited, uh, which postponed, in effect postponed, the national and regional elections and banned the Tigray region from, explicitly, uh, from holding its regional elections for its regional state council. Uh, knowing that the region would uh, really defy and go go ahead, then that's exactly what happened. I wanted to because, bring— Because, you know, you cannot tell— Yeah. I, I wanted to bring Stanley Chitekwe in from Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, the chief of nutrition, UNICEF Ethiopia. As we talk about the situation here, the ceasefire in the midst of the elections, you are dealing with, and the people of uh, the Tigray region, Ethiopians in the war-ravaged Tigray region, are facing the world's worst famine in a decade. Can you describe what's happening there and what has to happen, Stanley? Yes, thank you for having me. We are seeing very high levels of malnutrition among children under the age of five years of above 15 percent that is wasting, and this is considered to be very high. Malnutrition among pregnant and lactating women ranging from, ranges from 40 to 50 percent. Again, this is very high with potential long-term impact. And pre-crisis, pre the conflict, we realized also that uh, Tigray region had already a very high level of malnutrition, uh, stunting. Standard growth among under fives was already 10 percentage points above the national average. Wasting also was about two percentage points above the national average. And the latest study has shown that on food security, we have about 5.5 million people that are in, in a range which we call from IPC3, 4, and 5. So this is a very high proportion. And the report of looming famine comes from the fact that if certain risks are not removed, and there are mainly two risks that we are talking about, number one, continued conflict, uh, as well as number two, uh, limited access to provide humanitarian access, this malnutrition situation may deteriorate into famine. Stanley, what do you think urgently needs to be done? What are you calling on the international community to do uh, to alleviate uh, famine conditions in, in the region and also humanitarian access uh, uh, reaching the people who need it most? Yes, there are three elements that we know are very critical. Number one is to do with access. Uh, we know the conditions and situation are changing very rapidly. But as until now, we know that there were about 29 districts out of 93 that were hard to reach, and there were about 39 that were partially accessible. And out of the 93, we only had 21 districts that we had full access. So access is a very strong precondition. Number two, uh, we also realize that capacity is an issue. The extent of the challenge of malnutrition and food insecurity is so huge. There's need to ramp up support in terms of the capacity of the implementers, UN agencies, NGOs. We need more human resources, more materials to be able to respond, food, and specialized foods that we use to treat uh, severely malnourished children. So we are talking about need for additional capacity. 
And then resources. By resources, we are also talking about financial. A number of sectors, be it nutrition, food security, water, we are ramping up our response in order to reach people as quickly as possible within the next uh, 30 to 60 days uh, to avert the looming famine. So there is need for uh, additional financial resources from our generous donors. Stanley Chitekwe, who is getting in the way of people getting access to so much needed aid? I think up until now, uh, there were three entities, and we it's not always very clear which entity is making this. I think the main thing is that when there is conflict, when there is exchange of fire, it is not possible for humanitarian uh, workers to find a, a safe corridor. So access is also an issue of perception in terms of where you see there's an exchange of fire. It is impossible for our humanitarian workers uh, to, to, to access those places. So ceasefire is a precondition for access.